Hello, my name is Shelley Spector. I'm the founder and director of the Museum of Public Relations. And today we're gonna to be talking about some of the research that the museum did on the role of PR in protecting public health. And this is a history of pandemic communications going back to the flu of 1918 and just a little bit about COVID because when we conducted this research, COVID was still just in the middle of everything. And uh, we didn't have a chance obviously to look back at COVID. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about the museum. Uh, the museum has been in existence for about 25 years. It started at the urging of Edward L. Bernays, who was a good friend of ours for ten, the last 10 years of his life. And uh, he was the one whose idea it was to create the museum in New York City. So we've had about a thousand visitors every year up until COVID. Uh, March 12th, we no longer had visitors and we still don't have visitors today. So we have archives representing, uh, of course, the, the founders of public relations, Bernays, Ivy Lee, Ortha Page, Paul Garrett. And we also have a special collection now that is being incorporated into the artifacts of the African-American pioneers like Inez Kaiser and Joseph Baker and Moss Kendricks and the women that have never been talked about in the, in the history books, including Doris Fleischman, who was Bernays' wife, uh, Belle Moskowitz, Muriel Fox, uh, Barbara Hunter, and Marilyn Laurie. And so you walk in now and it's a highly diversified representation of the public relations field. Next. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's highly diverse history, but we were also talking about creating a more diverse future in public relations. And so we've been holding events five times a year to talk about uh, different populations and how they have succeeded in public relations and the challenges that they face. On the left, you see here uh, two years ago, this is Catherine Blades, uh, Catherine Hernandez Blades talking, uh, giving the keynote at our Latino PR history event. And um, on the right, you see our very first Zoom webcast, uh, which was held last May, um, covering the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And our next AAPI event is going to be online, of course, on May 12th. Next. This presentation uh, is devoted to the 3 million lives we've lost globally to the pandemic. And a lot of it, of course, has been due to poor communications. Next. Well, let's talk about the flu. Now, I've always had a very personal relationship with the flu because my father's sister, who is pictured here on the left, the little girl standing up, died at the age of five from the flu and my family never get over, got over it. You see the picture here on the right. This is right after she died. Uh, my father is sitting there on the left. My uncle George is in the middle. My uncle Irwin is on the right and my grandmother and her sister in the back. My grandmother is on the left there, but uh, something like that, you live with the rest of your life. I know that my father shared stories with me almost nightly at dinner talking about his little sister, Lizzie. Uh, here is her death certificate. And uh, you could see it says that she died of pneumonia, which is a common uh, progression of what happens after uh, with flu. And uh, my, uh, my grandfather and my mother are here listed as coming from Russia. And, you know, they came from Russia looking for a better life. And a few years later, when they start having a family, uh, five, their only girl in the family, Lizzie, dies of the flu. But this was going on throughout New York City, uh, throughout <laughs> Northeast and throughout the entire country, and of course, the world. Next. Now, when we study the flu of 1918, we really have to look at it uh, in many different contexts. So you have to look at it historically. What else was going on during that time? What were the communication channels available to us at that time? So we had newspapers. We were just about coming into having radio. We had newsreels. But the most important and the most uh, pr predominant form of communications between governments and the public were 
the uh, were posters, and you can see much uh, you know, very very heavy use of posters during this time. We also have to look at the trust in government, trust in federal government, and the trust in local government. And then we're going to spend a little time looking at flu back then in 1918 through 1920 as a branding theme for major corporations and their products. Now, the confluence of, very, of events is very interesting. And most people don't think of that when we had the 1918 flu, we were also going through World War I. And this World War I was both, uh, I'd say, uh, was a contributor to the to the flu, and the flu was a contributor to what happened in World War One because uh, the flu actually started not in Spain as a lot of people think. It started in Kansas. It started a military training camp in Kansas, and so the soldiers would come uh, to these camps, catch the flu, and maybe they didn't know it yet. They were shipped off to Europe where they further spread the flu. And so uh, the, a lot of the reason for so much difficulty during World War I was that soldiers were fighting and they were very, very ill. At the same time, we had the suffrage movement. Now, 1920, of course, women won their right to vote after many, many years. And uh, so women were out there uh, marching throughout the country, holding meetings, and uh, you know, women's liberation was beginning in this country. And at the same time in this country, we had masses and masses of immigrants coming in from Europe and Asia. Now, of course, that fit in nicely with America's need for factory workers and tailors and, and uh, shoemakers and railroad workers. So the US was promoting uh, you know, different from the way it is today. The US was promoting the fact that it had open arms for these immigrants because of the great need, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, great need for a workforce. And so tens of thousands of immigrants, like my own grandparents, came over. Um, now, what's interesting is that in 1918, something I think historians are finding surprising today is that masks were mandated by law back then. They weren't mandated by federal law, but they were mandated by local Red Cross chapters and local health departments. And they may do. Now, of course, there was uh, somewhat, some pockets of resistance to this, but overall, they dealt with it. You see this man here on the bottom in the center. He even created a hole for himself so he could smoke cigarettes. Some people uh, wore signs about wearing a mask. And if you didn't wear a mask, you could literally get picked off the sidewalk and thrown into jail. So every health department in the nation had uh, mandated masks in America. Uh, and to some degree as well, uh, social distancing, but they didn't call it that. They just uh, would cancel major sporting events, major political events and um, you know, uh, try to get people not to go into movie theaters and shows. So there was a, a, a realization on the part of health officials back then of how this flu was spread. Now remember back then, they didn't know whether flu was a bacteria or it was a virus. So you had you know, scientists working day and night to try to figure this out, um, but it wasn't until 10 years later or so that they learned that flu was a virus. And by the way, on the bottom right, uh, we have Babe Ruth wearing a mask. And the, so the use of role models, whether they were sports figures or Hollywood stars, started playing a very, very important role in healthcare education and persuasion. Next. Now, during this, uh, public relations people started playing a political role, which they hadn't played before. So we have on the top right, the uh, Commission of Public Information led by newspaper man, George Creel, who is the second elect in, the, uh, in uh, the line here. And Edward Bernays and Carl Beyer are the two men standing all the way to the right. Uh, Bernays is the man with the mustache, Carl Beyer is standing next to him. And both of them 
uh, were very active participants in selling the war to Americans. Now, Americans really wanted to be isolationists, but as the war progressed, Wilson, President Wilson said there was a great need for us to go and, and fight for the allies and to protect freedom and democracy. So Bernays and, and Karl Meyer both played a very active role in promoting the war and also uh, publicizing the peace treaty. They actually went over to, to France in uh, 1919 to write press releases about the peace treaty. Now, at the same time, you had um, Ivy Lee, he's here on the bottom, and he had been working for the Pennsylvania Railroad, so he was one of the very few public relations people at the time who had railroad experience. So it was not a surprise that when the Interboro Rapid Transit Authority, the one of the first subway systems, wanted a public relations person, they hired Ivy Lee. And uh, Ivy Lee took to uh, the subway system very well, and he wanted to create a greater bond between the system itself and the customers who were afraid for various reasons about riding the subway. Next slide. And uh, so he created the Subway Sun, which was the first, first uh, customer newsletter that we can find uh, in, in history, in corporate history. Maybe there were others, but this was certainly the first to be used on a form of uh, uh, everyday transit. And um, people were very afraid, of course, of riding on the subway, but they rode in the subway with masks on and with some helpful posters, such as uh, this one about spitting. Spitting was a big deal back then. I don't get it, but you see uh, this notice on a streetcar about spitting, and of course, the one on, on the left, but uh, working to educate the public about the spread and uh, the avoidance of the influenza in 1918 was a very, very important part of the work of public relations people like Ivy Lee. Next. Now, here's an interesting thing, is that uh, Wilson, who really never spoke publicly about the flu, didn't, because he didn't want to tip a hand to the enemy that we were fighting during the war, but he actually put an embargo on any news in the local papers uh, that talked about the deaths in local markets about the flu. So, uh, but despite that, uh, you know, despite the fact that newspapers did not write any stories, it got to be too much and, um, they uh, ended up writing stories about um, new regulations like public places are ordered closed. You see that in the lower right. And then how serious the flu is. So more and more papers were reporting on the local deaths because you know they had to, they were, they were journalists and this was a public service to their communities. So as more and more information came out from doctors, um, there were more and more articles about working to prevent the flu, but also about uh, the local count of deaths. And here is a story in the middle about uh, the overwhelming number of deaths in the city of Philadelphia and the mass graves that had to be dug for them. Next. And uh, as I mentioned, Wilson just wanted to wanted nothing to do with anything flu related, at least what we could find. And um, he felt that it would hurt morale and uh, be a danger to our ability to fight overseas. And, uh, you know, as this, as Tebby Troy says, uh, the, his response, the federal response to the flu is, was neglectful. Americans died without Wilson saying anything or mobilizing the government to help the civilian population. So there were no federal, there were no US federal agencies that were helping to deal with this outbreak. And you had a president who just ignored it altogether as if it was not happening, just did not want to deal with it because of what was going on overseas. So, but karma will kick in and we'll see. Next slide. 
Now, most of the communications was handled locally. There was tremendous trust between communities and the local departments of health to provide them information about how to deal with the flu, how to protect themselves, how do you know when to call a doctor, how many deaths in my local town. And so uh, weekly bulletins and posters would be coming out in every community around the country trying to protect the local people from the flu. And uh, again, there was nothing coming from the federal government. So the local communities had to pick up the slack. Next. And uh, here's an interesting quote. Uh, when you mix politics and science, you get politics because uh, what we've learned this year in the US with COVID is that you cannot politicize a pandemic like what was done. And we're still suffering this as a result of uh, disinformation and poor communications coming from the federal government. Next. Uh, now, what's interesting is that how many products look to tie in their marketing efforts with the flu? So some of them were kind of natural, like uh, Life Boy soap, which uh, kills germs, and then you know, enriched Horlicks malted milk, and Life Tonic, and Lysol. Uh, but one of the most interesting ones, one of the most out of the box one of the most out of the box ads that I've seen here is um, uh, Grunewald's, which was advertising to not just stay at home, but if you're gonna stay at home, learn to play the piano, entertain your family. So this was a company that sold player pianos and now they're tying into the biggest news of the day, which was the flu. So it was very interesting to see the great number of ads that uh, themselves tied into the flu. Next. Now, it was interesting that uh, Philadelphia had planned for a big parade with, um, for, to raise money for Liberty Loans. And although many people told them not to do this because of social distancing, they did it anyway. And, um, you know, the Philadelphia Inquirer, which had an obligation we think, to tell the people, to warn the people to stay home, did just the opposite. Why create a panic? We should talk of cheerful things, of health, for instance, the side of disease, which is quite unusual for a major city newspaper uh, to report on. So this is what the parade looked like. Okay, so you notice that the newsreel is silent because it would be about a decade until talkies were invented and he, people could hear music and dialogue on film. But you notice in this parade that uh, most everyone in the military was wearing a mask, but very few in the public were wearing a mask. And uh, then this happened. Next slide. Uh, 12,000 people died from that, uh, that incident alone. This was a, you know, a several hour parade, but with all the gathering on the streets and in the marching, 12,000 people's deaths were directly linked to this parade. And um, that caused a tremendous backlash with, uh, from people in Philadelphia to the Philadelphia Inquirer. Next. Now, I said before that karma would catch up to President Wilson, and it did. When he went over to sign the peace treaty in France after the war was over, he contracted the flu. He had a very, very high fever, but not only that, he suffered a decline in cognitive abilities so that his assistants around him said, wow, uh, he is really very, very different. He was almost uh, had dementia, it seemed like. And uh, his, his wife was mum about it. And uh, it, what was interesting is that he had planned a whole presentation about the negotiations, terms of negotiations 
with our enemy at the time, but when he sat down with them, he gave in to every one of the demands of the, of the enemies. And uh, the course of history was just changed in that moment when uh, Wilson sat down with the enemy to negotiate terms of the peace treaty and uh, it came out in very much in favor of the enemy. So the fact that Wilson was spared the flu for all this time, finally gets it when he is uh, negotiating the trade, the, the peace treaty. And because of his getting the flu, he's unable to, uh, to represent accurately America's interests. So now we look at the polio epidemic, which was very, very interesting and extremely different. It's 180 degrees in the way it was handled from the flu. Next. So you had, uh, if you look in the historical context, you had a great influence from uh, entertainers that were made famous because of Hollywood and all the movies that it was producing. Uh, movies were the biggest form of entertainment starting in uh, 1920 or so. They became uh, talking movies in 1929 with the jazz singer. And uh, also radios became cheap enough to bring into the home. Uh, this one here you see is in a beautiful wooden cabinet as most of them were at the time. And the whole family would sit around and listen to soap operas, which were uh, the reason that they're called soap operas because they're most often sponsored by soap companies. This was where you get information about um, news. This was your TV set, uh, except it didn't have a picture. This is the way it looked in uh, the 1930s. Um, but then in 1929, of course, we had the stock market crash. So you had the beginning of the depression, the Great Depression, which lasted more than 10 years. And this is a famous photo that Roosevelt used actually to sell into Congress to make the point to Congress how badly Americans were being affected by the depression. Uh, on the right, of course, is, uh, is Hitler. And you could see uh, 1933 or so, Hitler was coming to power in Germany. So in the 1930s, you had uh, a war that was beginning and you had uh, all these new sources of communications, mass communications, and you had the depression at the same time. Uh, but you also had immigrants that were still living in the inner city, the tenements, and so very closely housed together in, in very, very poor conditions. Next. Um, uh, in the middle here is, uh, it was a very, very common sight, unfortunately, that uh, these men who had fought in, uh, in World War I and came home, they were vets, were not given the, uh, the, the, the funds or uh, any compensation from the federal government or any support at all for fighting. And so now they come back from the war and uh, they cannot get a job because there was 25, 30% uh, unemployment in the depression. You also had um, household appliances that were now giving more leisure time to families. Uh, newsreels were now coming to the theaters once a week and that would uh, make everybody aware of what, what news was happening outside of their own neighborhoods. And um, you had the beginning of uh, what became World War II going on in Europe. And that was very much reported on newsreels such as this one. Now, during polio, uh, polio was a disease that whose victims were largely children and uh, it struck during every summer. So sometimes, especially in uh, ghettos, mothers would fear their children getting, getting polio and trying to send them away up to the country if they could. I know that's something that my grandparents did and um, you didn't want your child obviously to be exposed every, very, every summer to polio. Uh, one of the reasons that um, polio became so widely, widely known in the US was because our president at the time, he himself had polio. So it became a personal mission for him. Now, if you're familiar with the game Candyland, 
it was in an iron lung ward, as you see here, that um, made this third grade teacher who was also in an iron lung, who were watching the immobilized children dealing with their paralysis, uh, she came up with this idea of a game called Candyland and would tell the children uh, when they, before they were going to sleep at night about these two little, you know, little boy and girl going off to gingerbread plum tree land and, uh, you know, crooked old peanut brittle house. And uh, they were both able to run and move and jump and enjoy all the things that uh, little boys and girls should be doing instead of laying in an iron lung. So these, she was giving them a great gift uh, to use this in their imagination with the hope that one day they'll be able to get out of their iron lungs and uh, be able to walk and, uh, and move around as other children are doing. Um, after the war, she sold this to Milton Bradley. Maybe it was for $30, but eventually Milton Bradley continued producing this game and it's still around to this day. Next. Now, um, as I mentioned, FDR himself contracted polio. He contracted in 1929, right before he became president and during his campaigning and uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. He became president in 1932 and uh, all the while of his campaigning, through all the years that he was president, um, FDR wanted to keep hidden the fact that he relied on crutches and braces. His legs were totally paralyzed, and uh, but he didn't want people to pity him. He, it wasn't to show a weakness, it was that he didn't want people to focus on his health, but it certainly made him extremely empathetic to the great epidemic and especially its effect on children. And uh, what he did is he opened up a, uh, this resort and opened it up for free for children who were stricken with polio. There were warm springs down there, highly therapeutic for children with polio. And uh, this was a, a great benefit to children around the country and seen as, uh, you know, so positively for this president who was one of the most beloved presidents in US history. And uh, what a great opportunity also for newsreels and for photographers and feature writers to come down to Georgia and to write about FDR and giving so much to these children who were similarly aff afflicted, afflicted with, with polio. Now, one of his advisors, one of FDR's advisors had created the infantile paralysis campaign soon after FDR became president. And um, this eventually became known as the March of Dimes. The reason it became known as the March of Dimes is because um, many Hollywood stars would go on the radio in, in free time. So the radio donated time to stars who were giving public service announcements. And uh, one of these stars you could see here in the middle was Eddie Cantor. And uh, Eddie Cantor went on radio, national radio, and he talked about giving dimes to sending dimes down to the White House. And he said, on, you know, and he just said on the spot, and it will be just like a march of dimes. And um, that stuck. It stuck because it would shortened uh, infantile paralysis as a catch name and a name of a foundation, but it also sounded like March of Time. So this became immediately adopted by the country and uh, there was you know, tremendous promotion on both a, a national and, uh, and a local level. And uh, if, if you've ever heard the expression, the poster child, this is where it comes from. So the public needed to see where their dimes went and the good their dimes did. And uh, so lots of children around the country were employed by the local March of Dimes chapters to be photographed and to show how they recovered from, the, from polio, thanks very much to the, their contributions. 
and even Frank Sinatra joined the effort. So this little PSA was shown in the movie theaters. It's uh, two people that I'm sure you know, Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. You see, Judy, I've got my envelope made out right here. It's all ready to go. See for yourself. Oh, I know. That's a march of dimes. You have to drop for Alex's fun. That's right. And gee, when I spend a dime on myself for some little luxury like this, I always think about those unfortunate kids. How far just a dime will go toward helping. Gee, Mickey, we don't know how lucky we are and how much we have to be thankful for with our health and our happiness. Judy, and that's why we should do all that we can to help all of those who can't help themselves. Can I put a dime in your envelope? Oh, you know that you can. And that's what every good American should do. Join the March of Dimes. Send yours to President Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. Washington, D.C. So the campaign that was endorsed and uh, talked about by so many entertainers in Hollywood showed how important having role models um, to encourage the public about uh, polio, giving to polio, and the whole campaign was to raise enough funds to fight polio to, with a vaccine. And uh, this was something that, you know, every, the whole country was involved in doing. And um, the March of Dimes was smart enough to know that one of the best ways to get reluctant teenagers to get their shot is to use somebody like Elvis Presley, put them on the most popular show at the time, Ed Sullivan, and it would make big news. So this was a live vaccination he was giving on a Sunday night on the Ed Sullivan Show, which then was one of the most popular shows in the country. And it made news, as you can see the story in the Times, um, that he received his shot. And uh, children in 1954 were all called polio pioneers and uh, given badges to wear to prove that they were vaccinated. So I think we can learn some good lessons from this today with all the resistance to getting COVID vaccines. Next. And uh, here's Ed Elvis Presley on Ed Sullivan. You ain't not Hey, kids, could I talk to you for about 30 seconds? Well, this is Elvis Presley. If you believe polio is beaten, I ask you to listen. Remember me. Now, that's the voice of thousands who know the fight against polio is just as tough as it ever was. They're crippled, and the salt vaccine can't help them recover. But you can. Remember polio victim. Join the 1957 March of Dimes today. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll and part of a remarkable campaign that would see an end to a disease that was ravaging the youth of 1950s America. Now, back then, the most reluctant group to get their polio shots were teenagers who could still very much uh, become victims of polio, but they figured, well, if this disease was called infantile paralysis at one point, um, then it would not affect a teenager, which was completely wrong. So uh, one of the ways that the March of Dimes figured out how to really reach teenagers and influence them about getting shots was they formed this teen core of a million teenagers around in communities around the country. And um, they had, they created this campaign that uh, told people that if you're not vaccinated, you will not have a date with me. So. All these girls, at least teenage girls, if they were asked on a date by a guy, the first thing she would say to him is, are you vaccinated? And if he said no, uh, then she wanted nothing to do with him. And that became one of the most effective communications campaigns uh, for polio, is that one-on-one -on -one encounter between teenagers and the peer pressure, which is a very, very heavy, heavily influential force, as we know, for teenagers. So present day, we're just gonna you know, touch on COVID. And uh, you see how much compliance that we have now on subways. And um, you know, while the subways are not what they used to be as far as the number of people 
um, you can see that uh, their compliance is not too terrific with the posters that are in the subway cars. Now, the whole problem right now is that there is one fifth of adults, and you know, this is a, uh, a figure from this week, uh, late April, uh, would not get the, the vaccine uh, no matter what. And um, it probably will they one day become a requirement. Uh, but remember, there's still heavy influence of the Trump administration, still today right-wing media that's saying that COVID really doesn't even exist. So how can you make adults who feel that this is, that there is no real danger here, get a shot that they've been told in the media that they're looking at it is going to uh, afflict them badly. So we're, we're still dealing with the misinformation from the last administration. Thank you very much for your attention to this. And uh, if you'd like me to answer any questions or you are, find yourself in New York City, please do give us a visit at the Museum of Public Relations. Thank you.